Hey there gamers, I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. And on today's web DM, we're going to introduce some moral quandaries. So if you make it to the very end and watch the stinger, I'm gonna murder Jim Davis. What? <laughs> Jim, let's let's talk about moral quandaries. Moral? My, <laughs> come on, moral. <laughs> moral um, quandaries. Conundrums. Conundrums. It's, Putting your players in a in a place where they have to make a decision that has no clear outcome, no right answer. No, no right answer. And is just a little bit agonizing. Yeah. To 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 be in that spot. Well, These are the kinds. If you're of a conscionable right. individual. If you're a conscionable <laughs> individual, but there's even ways to do that for the murder hobo in your party. It'd be a good check on murder hoboism itself. If, if it needs if to it's be checked. Getting, if it's getting if a it little uh, uh, out of control, I, right? I, I, a long time viewers will know that I have no problems with murder hobos. It's a legit way to play the game. Anyway, well, it's the way the, <laughs> the way the game was originally played. It really was. I mean. Uh, it's also very fun. Oh um, well, yeah. <laughs> Where do we begin? I guess we need to begin with 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 the characters themselves. Right, and I I think it's one of those things where having a character that has connections to the world, things they care about, and some sort of moral compass or code becomes important because all of those components can be used by a dungeon master to produce scenarios where you're playing off of the character's ideals and flaws and things that they care about and the connections that they have to the world and weaving those into a campaign. It's not just that the goblins kidnapped a bunch of villagers, they kidnapped your relatives and what they're yeah. doing with them there is unconscionable, but then maybe something else is going on that makes it a little less clear cut. Right. Um, but you have to start with characters that care about the world that they live in and with players who are invested in that connection as well. You right. know, it's, it's everybody can knows or remembers or has heard a story of, uh, you know, that one player who just doesn't care. That, that no matter what you do, they're not engaged, they're, they barely pay attention when it's an action time and when it's downtime or a lull in, in the session, they're checked out entirely. Yeah. Maybe these techniques are not for that player, right? Like you're, no. th th that player is is in need of other interventions if you want, yeah. if you want if to keep them at the table. Yeah, if they're taking smoke breaks during the story time, <laughs> yeah, then just give them shit to fight when they get at the table. Sure, and, and just keep them distracted. If that's what if that's what they're in for. But so I'm talking about this is for those players who get into it. Yeah, they have a character that there's well fleshed out that they've spent a lot of time thinking of the personality of, or they're committed to you know building this character up through play and having it grow organically as the campaign goes. And you want to present them with scenarios that are, for lack of a better term, boundary crossing, agonizing, you know, sort of ringers. Yeah. That when they come out the other side, they're, they're glad for the experience, but they might not have called that fun. Right. right. Well, their, char <laughs> their characters would not have called that their fun. Their characters certainly wouldn't have called that fun. Yeah. Um, so connecting, you know, having characters that are connected to the game world is, is an important part of that. Uh, you know, whether that's uh, connections with a particular location or an organization of some kind where mm -hmm. they're, and particularly if, it's, if it stretches beyond just the party, you know, they've got connections to NPCs that they really like or a place that's important to them. Uh, these are things that the Dungeon Master can threaten. I'm going to try to pull you in two different directions, right? Like right. we're going to threaten something you care about and in the threatening of it also distract you with another thing you care about. So now mm -hmm. you have to make a choice. Which of these two things is more important to you? Which are you going to take actions to, you know, to solve? Right, do you do you save the boxcar full of people or Gwen Stacy? Sure, yes. If you're Spider-Man. If you're Spider-Man, that's right. kind of, that's that's, a, that's an example of it. I mean, there's a lot of examples of this. We're calling the show Moral Quandaries because it's a snappy title kind of thing. Yeah. But we're really talking about just any scenario in which your players don't have a good outcome. And, and yeah. sometimes it's through no fault of their own. They just sort of like walked into this or an NPC or a monster imposed it on them. Sometimes it's a result of their actions and just the, the natural consequences of player choice and NPC reaction have led us to a point where it's like, well, shit, there's, not, <laughs> there's no good outcomes here. Making the players have to sit with that and make a decision about what to do uh, is a very rewarding experience, but it takes some skill. 
to to pull off. Oh, oh, definitely. I will say this: my eyes have been opened a little wider uh, playing Call of Cthulhu. Right. Over on Encounter Roleplay, Will Absolutely. Jones is a master. It, it will is of, a Will Jones is a master of this form. Just putting yeah. you in a position where you're like, but I need to. Yeah, that means you have to. Yes. Yeah. We want your mind. Your mind in return for Mr. O'Kane's life. This is the power which my master commands. Power over time itself, Mr. Sloan. He can be brought back. All for a price, Mr. Sloan. Our friends over at Encounter RP, you know, watching Will's games or listening to the podcast that they run, they are full of these kinds of scenarios where it's like, yeah, the party has backed themselves into some kind of corner or the villains have gotten the drop on the party. Having someone that's invested in the game world gives the dungeon master these opportunities. When it comes to murder hobos, and which we're using murder hobo as a catch-all term for those characters and their players who don't care about the game world. Yeah, they, they are there purely for the mechanical effects of the game uh -huh. or they treat your campaign setting like it's an artificial thing and yeah. therefore don't react as if there are consequences in the game world for it. I'm a big fan of treating this simulation we're creating over here like that we're telling stories over in and, and participating in as if it's a real thing. Yeah. And just suspending our disbelief for a minute and pretending that we're gods intervening in this thing or whatever it is that we're doing. But treating it like it's real and treating the NPCs and PCs as if they're real people. And that's where this kind of, uh, this technique and the techniques that we're, we're gonna talk about will, will come in handy. Um, so for murder hobos, they still care about something. They got magic items they like. Mm -hmm. They got gold they want to acquire. There's stuff that they want to do. There's things that they care about, whether it's it's stuff that's on their character sheet that you can threaten, and there's an idea uh, floating out there in OSR circles that's called attack the character sheet, yeah. which is every section on that sheet can be messed with. It's not yeah. just the hit point thing in the middle. Oh, no, no. It's everything. They got gear, you can attack that. Yep. They got they got ability scores, you can attack that. That barbarian loves that strength. And now 5th edition has kind of scaled back that sum, but there's nothing stopping a DM from reintroducing a monster right. that when it hits you, okay, make that save. You failed, okay, your strength drops by four. Yeah, it's a, it's a souped up shadow or yeah. something that comes after them. So those are ways that if you've got players who are not invested in the campaign, they are not invested in the campaign world, but you want to try something like this. You can do that by threatening the things they care about. And, and trust me, when you start threatening the character sheet, their equipment, their ideals, their bonds, their flaws. When you start using those things in a manner that threatens what they care about, whether it's uh, something else in the game world or something that their character possesses, then you will start to get the kinds of reactions that, that you're looking for with these techniques, which is to put the party or the player in a situation where there's no good outcome, they're gonna have to make a sacrifice, and they're going to have to make some really hard choices. Yeah. And through the doing of that, we hope to have some, some great RP moments. Although there are some downsides that, uh, again, we'll discuss. Uh, yeah, yeah, we will get to that. But yeah, uh, with forcing the hard choices, what role does does alignment play, if any? I think it can play some role, yeah. right? And this is, a, this is a place where you can either lean into alignment mm -hmm. and you can say, I'm going to use this as a tool, I'm going to use this as a framework for uh, setting up these forces that will then result in this scenario. Some examples would be, um, what happens when uh, a lawful good character's commitment to good comes in conflict with their commitment to law? Yeah. This might be a classic scenario of like these orphans are hungry and they have stolen a bunch of food. The good compassionate thing would be to feed the orphans. However, they have broken the law and the law having been broken demands a certain amount of punishment. For a lawful good character, they now have a choice. If, particularly if they are in a position of power yeah. uh, over the, the NPCs that are accused of breaking the law, then you can force that. Now that's not a particularly uh, clever or original sort of conundrum, but yeah. it is like a classic one, right? Yeah. And it's those sorts of scenarios that you can do that. Like desperate people do desperate things right, to right. survive. And if you're in a position of power over them, then you might be like, well, yeah, you shouldn't have looted that thing. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have attacked these people on the road in order to take their money. But what are you using that money for? You right, know. right. Yeah, in the uh, the orphan scenario, the, the hardcore lawful good character would just be like, well, 
guess what? You get three squares a day in jail. Yeah, that's kind of, that's one way to put it. Yeah, you get three squares a day in jail or keep the food. I will pay the fine. You know, you can't do that anymore. And let's make sure that you're not in a position where you need to steal food. Yeah. You know, but now we're leaning more. Those are, those are more, say, good aligned solutions to it as opposed to lawful aligned, which says, well, maybe there's a work program you can go into. Whereas the chaotic good character in that same scenario might approach it completely differently. And for the chaotic character in that scenario, there is no conundrum. It's just like you needed to eat. Yeah. You know, you screw what the food merchant thinks about it. They should have given you food or there should have been something else. You know, they, yeah. they have this sort of like, I don't really care about the rules kind of thing. Their commitment to freedom and unrestricted action and non-hierarchical authority mm -hmm. are producing outcomes that are bad for people. Yeah. Right? This is the scenario where it's like, oh yeah, we got rid of the oppressive ruler and, and everybody's going to just settle into a nice equilibrium except chaos and disorder have, are reigning yeah. and people are now hurt. Yeah, nobody's going to work so there's no food and everybody's starting to starve and, but hey, everybody's free to do what they want, man. Right, do what you know. they want, but that freedom has induced paralysis and fear and uncertainty, yeah. which is not what the chaotic good sort of character wants. Yeah, and there's free love and now VD's everywhere. I mean, <laughs> right. there's, there's consequences to being chaotic good. Right, you and know? you can even, you know, look, those are the corner alignments and this is why I like the corner alignments because yes. they are they are composed of two competing principles that are not always in forgive me, alignment with each other. <laughs> Jim. Um, so that's that's one way to do it. We can uh, lean into the alignment chart. We can find ways that you can use the character's alignment to introduce scenarios that goes against one of their principles that they hold, while at the same time supporting another principle, and that will produce a sort of conflict. You can flip the script, and you can say, I'm going to not look at the alignment at all. I'm going to have some good goblins, or a good dragon, or at least introduce some moral grayness into the yeah. picture so that when the players make the assumption of like, this is a monster, it's evil, we gotta kill it, yeah. maybe not. Like, a, like maybe a red dragon that's like, true neutral? And, and is there to potentially help the players and, and not a source of treasure and experience points for them. Subvert the player's expectations, but you also want to let them know that you're doing that in some way. Yeah. You want to project that out in some capacity. Maybe they quietly observe the monster in question uh, w w while it's by itself or something, and they observe it doing something compassionate or doing something that's not necessarily keeping in keeping with its evil nature. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe beasts and things like that, manticores and chimeras and, and hydras and everything like that, you're treating them more like natural animals that have monstrous qualities to them and not these malevolent evil monsters that have been unleashed on the world. Maybe they have young that they're defending. And that's a very understandable thing, right? Like a bear that attacks you because you come between it and its young yeah. isn't evil, but it's no less destructive, no less yeah. violent, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you don't want that outcome regardless of its intention. Yeah. And unless you have a druid or some other naturally inclined character, right. you should meet that aggression <laughs> equally or you die. Or you die. Uh, you it, know, I mean, <laughs> but, uh, but are you evil for killing that bear protecting its... You know, right. I mean, well, I mean, this this comes down to where you know thinking about things in good and evil is is, is uh, you know insufficient framework exactly. for these kinds of questions. Which is why if you've got a group that's used to thinking in terms of alignment and used to thinking in terms of black and white morality, which in Dungeons and Dragons base game exists, there are planes where it's evil and planes where it's good. If you don't like it, change it. But in the baseline game, it exists. You can subvert that. And you could say like, okay, we are not doing that this time around. Even mm -hmm. if you tell them in session zero or the yeah. first time like, hey, we're not using alignment. Or you can use alignment as a guideline for how your character acts, but as a real force in the world, it does not exist. Demons are hell bent on, sorry, not hell bent, abyss bent on destruction <laughs> and chaos and annihilation, but they're not capital E evil. Yeah. You know, that's just their nature to do that. Then you can, by introducing traditionally evil enemies who are now no longer evil, they just have motives that the players don't want. They don't want to see succeed. They have goals that the players oppose. But sometimes they maybe have sympathetic goals. Sometimes there's a bit of understanding with your enemies there. And we've got a villain show where we discuss these things a little bit further about motivations for your villains, things like that. Yeah. Introducing relatable motivations for villains can also produce a sort of moral or, or just tough choice for yeah. the player. Classic example of this is the orc baby. Right? Orc babies. <laughs> you know, 
classic you example. Slaughter the orcs. Right. What to do with their young? But what what do you do with when you find that orc nursery and there's five orc babies that are mewling and crying because they're just hungry? Right. You've introduced a certain degree of uncertainty to it, but you've also you've, you're revealing something about your world with it. Some players don't like that, but you have introduced a scenario where the correct course of action is unclear. You know, if you've got a world where these are monsters, that orcs are not a natural yeah. people that that have their own civilization and culture, they are monsters through and through. Yeah, completely irredeemable. Right, that's one thing. But if the players just assume that about the orcs, and your orcs are not that, then you have introduced a complication that the players then have to wrestle with, which yeah. is really what we're going for here. Yeah, um, and, and, and that should enrich your campaign and not detract from it, right? Right. It should. It should do that. Now, you know, we'll we'll get to a minute about ways in which this can go wrong and and, and right, like, right. But but some some more examples, yeah. like the like the org baby, uh, one that it has to do with children, but in your Razzle Sin game. So Razzle Sin is a, a game that we ran. Uh, it's on our it, it's on our channel, on our playlists, and I it was a I wanted to feature a hag, and I you know let's figure out what the hag wants. Reading through the monster manual, like oh my god, they reproduce by eating babies and then introducing a changeling into the mix and I tweaked that a bit. I introduced a degree of uncertainty in the in the lore of the hag that says are the children that a hag takes who will one day grow up to be hags when they hit their 13th birthday are those girls really the humans that they were original that were originally taken or are they some sort of fey changeling? Mm -hmm. And I introduced enough uncertainty that it was just like, your characters don't know. No one knows. Right. And there's, it's possible, the paladin thinks, for there to be some sort of ritual of atonement or cleansing that would remove the curse that's on these children that will turn them into a hag. Yeah. But there's not enough time to do that. Well, I mean, yeah, because it's the whole thing is in the Razzleson campaign world, all these girls that were taken, it's the 13th year. And it's the month 13th by year. month, there's going to be turning, another one of them. There's yep. another one. And I, what, what were you up to, like March or April? You were up to March, March, so there was already enough to form a coven. Yeah. Every two months, there's enough to form a coven. And then on that third month, Razzleson just moves on to the next one. Now there's a third, now there's a second coven operating in the area. Yeah. Until there's eventually four of them that she's at the head of. And who knows what they're going to try to do there. But that has to be stopped. Right. We cannot allow this demon hag to go around doing this and in the process terrorize all of these people. But are these children, are these 13 year old girls on the cusp of adolescence scared, frightened, they know that their friends, their friends' families are dead, that whenever one of these things transforms, it rips through the village, tear, you know, kills the family, mm -hmm. causes a bunch of disruption, people are scared, people are going to start taking action into their own hands. Right. Yeah. And and the last time that this happened, there was a pogrom against the local fae, not to mention extreme paranoia amongst the villagers that it took a long time to, to unravel. So all of that is the scenario that you drop the players into. Mm -hmm. And then you tell them, you've got to stop this woman. You've got to stop this hag. She can't do it. Yeah. And what that does is, like, there is an, a difficult goal here. Root out a hag that lives in this place and has spent its entire unnatural existence here insinuating itself amongst the people and a bit of uncertain difficult goal a bit of uncertainty uh, we don't exactly know what it is that we're supposed to do or whether what we're supposed to do is is acceptable and then have a questionable solution which was we could just kill all these children that will stop <laughs> that will stop the hag but um, that requires the, the players to then go to these villagers and be like, no, your daughter needs to die. She's not really your daughter. This loving, thought, you know, wonderful child that you've raised for yeah, the last 13 for the years, last 13 years uh, not, not really who you thought it was. Yeah. And next month, she's going to turn into a monster and kill you. You know, you can see that. You can watch these videos, right? And you can see the players grapple with, should we do this, should we not? Is there a better way forward? And if they're... If they're committed to playing, say, morally upright, upstanding individuals, then they might choose the more difficult path yeah. and say, like, yeah, we don't know what we need to do, but we're going to save as many of these people as we can. And, and you know, the, the ones that have already turned into hags, they're gone. We, we kill those monsters. But these other children, we try, 
Um, what happened in the game was <laughs> not anything like that. And, and eventually uh, the, there was murder and, and the quick solution was taken. But it was one of those things that felt very natural. It felt very like, oh my, we, you know, we can't do this. And, and one of the players was very frustrated and just sort of feeling like, not as a player, but like their character was very frustrated. And they were like, I, I just kill one of them and the parent. Um, and Yeah, we were just in the woods <laughs> with the mom and this kid. Who's going to turn any minute now? Or, she was like, it was, a, yeah. It was like the next one. And it yeah. Was, in the next week, she was going to turn. Yeah. yeah. And we just ice her in the woods like it's freaking Miller Crossing or something. <laughs> um, yeah, that's sort of an extreme <laughs> example of, of that. But uh, you can see it unfold through actual play. Yeah. But it, it's an example and, and probably one of the ones that I've personally experienced that was the darkest and the most unexpected uh, for me uh, kind of took me off guard when it happened. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> shit got dark. Shit got very dark very fast. But it's not the only one that we've experienced. You, you recently, you you sort of tried to do something similar uh, with your opening of uh, Star Wars Bound, yeah? Uh, yeah. They saw a town being attacked, uh, Neogi Death Spider taking off, they go in pursuit, they get on board, and, and I tried to describe the, the crew members as like emaciated and their clothes were ratty and they weren't really taken care of. And yeah. they seemed like scared and hesitant, but they're still fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them seem, and some of them seemed like, like blank face, like just not there. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't them. They used, they knew that the Neogi enslaved people. Some of them just decided to not attack the people that were on the ship and try to get to the Neogi. Yeah. The barbarian raging just starts going to town. Yeah. And ends up being the only person killing people. And then, of course, at the end of it, Literally. yeah. The Neogi was using the families as hostage to right. force these people to crew its ship. The robot, they're yes. <laughs> kind of dealing with what they did and yeah. the ram ramifications of that. Right. And so we're, that's still playing out. Of course, by this time this airs, that will have already played out. But, Probably played out, yeah. You know, I, th I wanted to do that because I just didn't want it to be like, oh yeah, they're slavers and you attack them and kill them and you, oh, you save Right, you don't have to think about it. And so like, that's, that's the, a, another good example of it is putting combatants in the way of the party that need to be overcome, but don't necessarily need to be killed. Seeing what the party does with that information. Do they pick up on the clues and act on it? If they pick up on the clues and just decide like, yeah, my character doesn't care, uh, then that's a that's a choice they're making. And, and maybe they're making the choice of, I don't let this bother me. This is not gonna get to my character. They, after the fact, make a choice of like, oh man, I really didn't wanna do that. But having like combatants that need to be overcome, but not necessarily killed is another way. Partly that subverts player expectations. Players assume that we should just mm -hmm. like cut our way through all encounters that we face. That's the way the game as it's evolved over the last few years has trained people to think about Dungeons and Dragons. Combat's yeah. there, we're gonna kill all the monsters, take their treasure, move on to the next thing. And so you can subvert those expectations to some degree. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's just, that's kind of been something in culture itself is that degree, that degree of uncertainty. The yeah. moral grayness. Like, how important is it to you? That you, that you introduce uncertainty into yeah. your game. I, I think in cases where you want to make, have the players make an agonizing choice or have to deal with the consequences of two mutually exclusive decisions that neither of the outcomes are particularly desirable, but they have to make a choice. You have to introduce some kind of uncertainty into your game. If you've got a black and white morality, you're rigidly adhering to the alignment chart. These creatures over here are evil. You don't need to think about how you treat them. First off, I, I find that even in my pretend is not something I want to engage in. I never want to get into a position where I'm like, I don't need to worry about how I treat these sentient creatures because I, that's just kind of person I am. I'm that guy. I'm Britta. I'll be a Britta. Yeah. I don't mind. That's Jim, fine. you're the Jim, you're the worst. <laughs> It doesn't buy. It doesn't matter to me that much. Like I, I, AT and T of DMs. <laughs> but I, that's my personal play style. Is I like to I like to, to think like what if, if this person were real? Then how would they exp be experiencing this? Yeah, yeah. You don't you don't drink the Kool Aid or, or just take in the propaganda. Of sure. All orcs are evil. I don't. I don't. They are yeah. they're they're duped by Grumch. Yeah. Anyway, um, and mistreated by everyone else. Having a degree of uncertainty is important if you want to pr produce scenarios and decision points where there's no clear outcome. Yeah. If the players have a, a certainty, and now they might, for themselves, right, they might decide that my paladin is certain. They have a moral compass, they have a code that guides them, they are in, in tune with their deity. That's a role-playing choice that they're making. But you can, you can remind them that just like, yes, that's your character feels that way. Objectively speaking, 
you guys have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. Dude, I did something similar with like whether or not the children could be saved in Razzle Sin. I would say like, you know that it might be possible, it might not be. If it's possible, it's going to involve this big long ritual which may or may not work. Uh, and you may or may not have time for. And so then you're, you're giving players enough information that they can make a decision, but you're not giving them so much information and in a concrete way that it's obvious which course of action is the right one. Yes. Uncertainty in your games is a, is a spice to be used lightly. Right. <laughs> right, because you can go too far. And so, you, I mean, you really need to know your players' boundaries. Right? You need to know your players' boundaries. You need to know how they enjoy the game. Number one, what is it they enjoy out of the game? If you've got a bunch of players who are here for a beer and pretzels, cut loose, we've had a shitty week style of game. Yeah. They want to fight a monster, get some treasure, dick around with some NPCs. They might not appreciate this style of game. This is this is why, and I think this is a positive trend that's in, in, in the role-playing hobby right now, which is that the dungeon master is creating something for the players and the player's input both before the game starts and during the game is incredibly important. And it's a style of adventure that I, I've long advocated and, I long, and, and that I really enjoy, part because it's less work for the dungeon master if there's the whole table is coming up with ways to run the game and whatnot. Yeah. So it, if you've got players that you play with regularly who are invested in the game world, uh, who you know, then it's it's time to start getting to know those players on a deeper level. What are their what are the things that they're just that are always going to be off limits for them? There's some groups like to do this in session zero. They want to know here here are my here's my line. Please don't cross it. Yeah. Um, others it sort of comes out in play and everybody agrees to a bit of flexibility as we sort of figure things out. But as you play with the same group long enough and you get to know the people and you play with friends, then you have an understanding of where their boundaries are and you start to build up a trust that will allow the dungeon master to start towing the line and just like poking across that boundary and taking something that a player holds sacred or, or important or sacrosanct or something and saying like, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put, touch, I'm just gonna touch, I'm just gonna poke mm -hmm. and see what happens. And some players are not gonna like this and, and that these are techniques that you don't use with players like that or yeah. you discuss mm -hmm. with them ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, and, and, some, and they're like, no touching. No, no touching. touching, no touching. And yeah. some players like that, right? Yeah. There are some players who sign up to be provoked, to have their boundaries crossed, to be placed in uncomfortable situations. I am one of those gamers. I want something weird and messed up and, and uh, disturbing to happen because I like living in that space and I like sipping from it uh, as, as opposed to you know diving right in. <laughs> but I enjoy it and I don't mind having my boundaries crossed provided I trust the dungeon master is doing it in a way that's not about a power game and is more about creating an interesting uh, scenario for the role playing. Um, but the other things that you need to know, you need to know why your players like playing. This is why I am interested in like RPG theory and, and the craft behind role playing games and things like that, mm -hmm. because it helps you understand why I like this game. Some people play all their life and they never really know why they play. It's just a thing that they do. And others have a better idea of why they play. And I, I think I'm, I'm a big fan of just introspection in general, knowing more about yourself and knowing more about what you do is better, so it must also be better for role-playing games. I think it's up to the dungeon master to get to know their players well enough that they can say, this is why this player likes playing. And that's a powerful piece of information to have when designing encounters and scenarios and things for, for that group of players. So getting to know them is, is important. And I wouldn't recommend a lot of these techniques for players, like say at a convention game where you don't know them, mm -hmm. or just a random pickup group, say at Adventurers League or something, where you're like, I don't really know these people. These are more techniques for you know them. Everybody trusts each other. You've been playing together for a long time. When trying to push the buttons and, and, and introduce this type of play, you can cross the line. And that's, there's, there's downsides. There's, there's pitfalls. Yeah, there's absolutely downsides. The biggest one is crossing boundaries is a, is a transgressive act. And there are some people that do not like that. Yeah. They either have either had something very bad to happen to them in the past and they don't want to be in, in situations that remind them of that. I've played with players like that and all it takes for me is a, hey, I don't want X, Y, Z to happen to my character. I, I'm, this makes me uncomfortable or it reminds me of something that I don't want to particularly be reminded of while yeah. I'm trying to play my escapist fantasy. Yeah. Then you just say, eh, no problem. No sweat off my back. 
right? No, whatever the metaphor is. Or no skin off my teeth. <laughs> skin off my teeth. No. I don't mind having my boundaries crossed, provided I trust the dungeon master. Yeah. But if I don't trust the dungeon master, or if I suspect that they are doing the transgressing and the boundary crossing as part of a, a power move, to just being a bit of a dick. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it just takes a whiff of it for me to completely go the other direction and go, nope, I'm tired of this. I, I don't, I'm, I'm out. I withdraw my consent to, for this scenario. Right. You know? <laughs> and, and as we all know, when, no matter when, when consent is withdrawn, you do not continue. Well, you don't continue. And it, it just holds for any kind of social situation, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's, you're, everybody's here voluntarily to have some kind of entertainment and to be engaged in some way. And so to continue to, push against a boundary that another person does not want pushed against and does not want crossed makes no sense to me whatsoever. It, it, it becomes one of those things, for, particularly for dungeon masters who insist that this is their right, that they can do this. It, that's where it, we've crossed into power territory over here. Yeah. This is not about playing a game. This is about power relationships between people. I'm not interested in playing mammalian politics with you guys. I'm interested in playing some Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. You know. <laughs> That's just who I. That's just me. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't don't bring your ineptitude in the other parts of your life to the table, <laughs> right. where this is the only place where you have true power and you try to exercise it over others. Right, and for the player who it continually finds themselves in a situation where their boundaries are pushed against and they, it is unwanted, then it's time to get out. Yeah, it's it's time, and particularly if you don't have someone who's. Uh, who's receptive to being talked to. You don't have a dungeon yeah. master who's like, that you can go to and say, hey man, what you did the other night, that I was not happy with that. I'd rather it not happen again. Yeah. If you're met with anything less than, oh my bad, I, you're not gonna happen again, then it might be time to consider leaving the group because that's indicative of someone who does not care about your experience of play and that's not a person worth playing with. Yeah, because that just fosters resentment, mistrust, and now no matter what you're doing, you, that's always going to be in the back of your mind. It's always going to be in the back of your mind. And so that, that dovetails nicely, what a way to go pro it, into the, another sort of the downsides of this style of playing is that particularly when uncertainty or morally gray uh, uh, scenarios or something in some players will induce extreme uncertainty, paranoia, and mistrust. And that is not a good place to be in for very long. No. Because this whole thing, that we're doing runs on trust. It runs on a player trusting that the choices that they're making for their character, the dungeon master will respond to. It runs on the dungeon master trusting that the players are not trying to cheat and finagle the system in ways that are unfair for the other players or themselves. Mm -hmm. It runs entirely on the bonds of social cohesion. We all get together and have a group activity that is fun and engaging and stimulating and lets us escape from our lives for a brief uh, few hours. If those things are broken, then the problem has occurred. And it's probably up to the dungeon master to say, all right, guys, I'm going to step back for a minute. I've noticed some things. Mm -hmm. I, let's talk about it. Is this a result of this scenario I introduced or this NPC I introduced? Do you guys feel like you can't make... Like, we're not talking every decision be agonizing. We're talking about select key decisions that define a campaign or that produce a memorable scenario. Not like every damn thing you have to do in the game. Right? Right. <laughs> like that is not an engaging game session. Um, and so those are situations where you might need to sit down with the players and say like, okay, here's, let's metagame for a minute. Let's talk this out. Work through what it is so that you guys know this is the part where your characters don't have a clear idea and this is the part where they do and I don't want you to feel like you can't make any decisions or, or anything like that. Um, so extreme paranoia, Distrust, that's a likely outcome. And if that's not kept under control and, and reversed, you will have a group that disintegrates because they can't do anything. Yeah. And you're just going to get frustrated and they'll get frustrated and then why are you sitting around a table playing? Just go home, do something else. Yeah, because then the player has the moral quandary to continue uh, playing or not with that group and it's a hard decision. <laughs> it's, it's a hard decision. And so like... That, that, she gets that, meta. That's another thing, right? <laughs> like you're... These scenarios sometimes 
are they will go against a player's morals, right? Mm. And now the whole game kind of goes against it, right? None of us, as far as I know, I have never played with someone who advocates extreme violence as a, a problem-solving tool, right? <laughs> but Dungeons and Dragons is about very violent people solving their problems through violence. Yeah, yeah. It is an act is a heroic action game with swords and fire magic and shape shifting and mind control and all these kinds of things that if they were in the real world would would be atrocities yeah. right but we suspend a bit of that disbelief we are able to we're be a little bit flexible and we're saying like ah you know it's a it's a it's not that serious right this is an elf game let's not take it too seriously but yeah. there are times where a player's sense of morality and propriety and what's right and wrong is a bit like crossing their boundaries uh, it comes into conflict with their own character's actions yeah, and that's a delicious place to be. I think personally, mm -hmm. <laughs> I really like it when, uh, the, where I find myself going, my character's actions in this scenario I find morally reprehensible. Yeah, but it's more interesting for them to pursue this course of action because I, you know you like it, or maybe you enjoy playing an evil sob every now and then. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean it, it, it is fun every now and again. Uh, one of my last points here would be your uh, Out of the Abyss game, where we played right. the evil campaign. Yeah, and just the moment where uh, Autumn's vampire lets her two blood thralls go because right. they're going to be an impediment to our progress. Uh huh. And she just fed, and you're like, I'll be all right for a while. Yeah. So she lets them go. Yeah. And Rovian's like, my my mystic warriors, like, they could track us. They could help the people looking for us track mm -hmm. us. So he goes with the group, they let him go, he's like, all right, I'm going to go scout ahead, and he doubles back, back and goes and murders them. Right. Because that was the quickest, he's like, no, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to be tracked down because her her lapse of conscience. He wasn't going to get caught because of one character's lapse of feels. Right. You know, <laughs> she had feels for one moment, it's she like, that's what brought us down. Yeah, that's no, what that wasn't, down. that wasn't going to happen. But the, he, the characters that Rovian goes and the NPCs that Rovian goes and, and murders mm -hmm. were like, no dark vision having commoners in the Underdark. Surface for, dwellers. He in was the doing underdark. them a favor, really. First off, you are doing them a favor, because you undoubtedly were more merciful than the hook horror or the carrion the, crawler. Carrion would crawler would eat them alive. Those kinds of things that'll, that will eat them alive. So, uh, that's the kind of thing and and to kind of return <laughs> thank, thank you for thank you for giving me some rationalization yes. <laughs> to return to some examples placing the players in a position of real power over npcs is something i love to do whether that's giving the players a magic item that is that way out levels them and will be useful for pretty much their entire uh, career and that gives them a degree of power or they have some sort of power invested in them through a title or a position or just like you've got someone at your mercy those are the moments where you learn something about both the character as well as the player playing that character. Because there's sometimes when you flip the script and the player has all the power over an NPC and their character has that NPC at their mercy, that's when you start seeing very m merciless and pragmatic and cold-eyed rational behavior from players where they're like, yeah, we kill these people, we murder these NPCs, and we, you know. Those are other sorts of... Uh, other examples of the kinds of techniques you can use, whether it's you know, placing them in a situation where their morals are in conflict or giving them a degree of power over a, an element of the game world that, that uh, and seeing what they do with it, throwing foes at them where it's not clear whether they should be killed, negotiated with, simply defeated, and, and then treated mercifully. Um, all of these scenarios, what to do with prisoners, what to do with people who've been mind controlled, what to do when uh, someone that your character loves turns out to be working with or, or, or connected with an enemy, what to do when an item or an object or a location that the character cares about is threatened while at the same time another location, item, or object, like a double threat, right? Um, those are all things that you can do to create these sort of moments of agony Mm -hmm. And moments of just like, what in the world do we do? Or like, we were, we're trapped, the dungeon master's outsmarted us. Those are techniques to use, and they're not without their downsides. A lot of players don't want to have to worry about killing orc babies. Yeah. They don't want there to be orc babies at all. They don't want 
to have to worry about a moral quandary or what are the ramifications of a course of action they're taking. They want to kick open the door and blast the monster and collect the treasure. And yeah. that style of play is fun and that style of play can be engaging. I find it less rewarding than one that's deeper and one that treats the characters as real things and uh, that tries to provoke those tough decisions. you could be more in tune with your character or stay in character better. I find myself getting better over time, but it can be difficult when RPing the unexpected response. The, the best thing that I can offer you, because uh, in my experience, I didn't realize how little I RP'd my characters until I started playing Call of Cthulhu uh, with the people over at, at Encounter Roleplay. And then I started playing with it, I'm like, oh shit. No, they're, they're like into this. Like, they're really into this. And what I try to do is come up with just a few um, a few demeanors depending on the situation. How does your character? How does your person react to things when he's in a good mood? Does he is he always supportive and this? How does he react in a sad mood? Or how does he react in an angry mood? Like, do you get quiet when you're angry? Like, try to come up with a few demeanors and let that be the starting point so that you know the situation you're in. If it's the start of an adventure and you're all happy-go-lucky, we're on the way to the dungeon where you're probably in a fairly good mood, so at least you have a starting point to go on. Um, but never forget that if you're really trying to, to role-play this character as a, as, a, as a real thing, as a real person, well then, believe that they're a real person. This is make-believe, and that's the thing. Is like You kind of have to let go of the ego a little bit. And when somebody says something to you in a negative, negative, uh, in a negative way, or like a like a an insult or whatever, I, I find that I started to realize like I was reacting a little bit because I'm into it, but it's me, mm. and so I'm reacting, not my character. Yeah. And so start noticing those moments and really like set them aside, like take that and put it to the side, and. Um, and yeah, just, I mean, it really is just about breathing life into your character by believing that they're real, because that's the whole point. It is make-believe. You are making yourself believe in this uh, just because, because that's the point of this game. And so it is an escape, and it's, you know, uh, so let yourself escape into it. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that was too rambling. But. Oh, it's rambling. You did fit it in three minutes. I'm a rambling man.